All right. Good afternoon from London, everybody. I'm going to get going with the webinar as uh, the last few registrants start to usher their way into the webinar software. So welcome to this webinar on critical functions of a modern control tower. My name is Hallie Garner, uh, and I head up the research and content initiatives here at EFT. Uh, I'm going to be joined by Brian Hodgson, who's EF EVP of MP Objects, as well as Dolph Lowhouse, who is Director of Freight and Distribution Management at DSV. Uh, and what we're going to be discussing is one of the big, big topics of well, supply chain as a whole, and of course that's visibility. Uh, and we're going to be exploring one of the key ways to uh, possibly manage that, and that is of course uh, the, the usage of a modern control tower to do so. Um, so Brian's going to be presenting a little bit on the background of the modern control tower, while Dolph provides a lot more of the practical applications and that hands-on experience of uh, implementing one uh, within within DSV. Um, just some housekeeping uh, before we move on to the actual content of the webinar. Uh, well, first of all, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, what that means is that if you skipped a little bit or you, know, you had to step out of the office for whatever reason, don't worry. Um, I'll be sending out recordings uh, as early as tomorrow. Um, so you'll have those in your inboxes then. Um, secondly, questions. This is a live webinar, so you actually have the opportunity to ask both Brian and Dolph all of your questions. So using the question tab on the webinar software, feel free to submit your questions and we'll tackle as many of them as we can uh, at the end of the presentations. All right. Well, without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Dolph, who's going to be presenting to you uh, a little bit further on the background of DSV. Dolph? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, DSV, uh, as a global transport and logistics uh, company, uh, we started in 1976, uh, uh, where 10 independent and holiest joined forces and founded DSV in Denmark. Uh, since then, DSV has evolved in uh, becoming world's fourth largest supplier of global solutions within transport and logistics. Um, within DSV, and uh, you see that whilst the slides uh, continue, there are three uh, divisions, air, sea, road and solutions. Uh, within DSV Solutions Netherlands, I'm heading up the freight management uh, department, and that means that all freight related uh, business is that is coming through our uh, logistics uh, warehouses and from our logistics companies uh, uh, are handled via my team. Um, within uh, within solutions, uh, um, um, you see that we uh, uh, we add value to our customers' entire uh, supply chain by transporting, uh, storing, packaging, repackaging, processing, and clearing all types of goods. Uh, we work every day from many of our offices in more than 80 countries uh, to uh, ensure steady supply chain of goods uh, the, uh, on production lines, outlets and uh, stores and consumers all over the world. So it's also B2C related. Um, and, and with that in mind, our reach is uh, global yet and still our uh, presence uh, local and uh, close to our customers. Um, so we could go to the next slide. So, in terms of market perspectives, uh, 2018 and 19. So these would be, would be some general uh, uh, general visions on on what we see uh, uh, throughout uh, throughout uh, Europe, especially is is warehousing capacity. There there's a huge pressure on as, as both a demand and supply uh, side uh, on 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 growth on warehousing capacity. E-commerce, we see a huge growth. At least already over the last years, and 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 even a growing, uh, even more growing aspect. Whilst, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Whilst also the the, the system that we're uh, talking about will uh, will give us much more benefit. And that also relates to big and uh, big data analytics and and uh, giving giving us more overview of uh, of all data that that we're handling. One of the key points uh, we see is a huge development. Within, uh, within as well as our, uh, our company is 3D printing and, and that's the complete uh, process of not just printing in itself, but also the market and in, in, in supplying uh, all the attributes that are combined with uh, 3D printing. Uh, furthermore, uh, what we're seeing is, is getting more strategic partnerships all, all over, uh, 
all of the, uh, the different processes in, in terms of market economic growth. Um, and we see uh, more and more partnerships, stronger partnerships within, uh, within uh, logistics uh, companies. So back to you, Brian. Very good. Thank you, Dolph. Uh, and just as a bit of background, uh, we've been working with DSV for a number of years and, and had the opportunity uh, to first meet Dolph last year. Very impressed with sort of the work that you guys have done. And I think everyone will here hopefully benefit from uh, some of the some of the trends that, that Dolph sees and the, the results he's achieved and, uh, and also some of the feedback that I'm going to present here. Uh, based on discussions with uh, with many other prospects and customers as we work with the market, so excited as I look at the attendees, good nice mix of of uh, some people I've spoken to in the past and and some customers and some new folks. So really appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Uh, what we're going to do sort of for the rest of the of the session is I'm going to provide a bit of an overview of some of the trends we see and, and some uh, scenarios that, that uh, I run into with customers and questions they ask me sort of on a daily basis. Uh, then we'll drill into sort of the, the definition and sort of different types of control towers uh, and then get into the critical capabilities and some of the use cases and I think Dolph also has some very good input on that and his experience. And then we'll finish up with uh, Dolph will go through uh, so sort of the, the specific situation and, and how we applied the technology uh, DSV in the Netherlands uh, and then we'll wrap up with sort of implementations recommendations. So in terms of uh, you know sort of pressure, sort of a macro standpoint, what we see is uh, sort of things really applying pressure to traditional supply chains in three areas. Uh, first of all, customer demands uh, continually accelerating, uh, getting more specific, and also fragmented, serving you know a broader set of customers, each with unique requirements and heightened requirements. They want more visibility uh, that could be to transportation, but beyond things beyond transportation could be looking at, hey, what's the inventory uh, that they're, that especially in, in a 3PL case where there's inventory being held, uh, or there may be value added steps in the process. Uh, for example, one customer working with uh, ships, uh, they do technology equipment, uh, and their customer, you know, at the last steps of the delivery, there's some certification and installation steps, uh, and they want visibility to those types of things from the service technician. Uh, and those are getting more and more demanding because each customer has unique requirements. So managing those across a broad set of customers is becoming much more challenging. Uh, and then the second area is around differentiation. How are companies differentiating? They're introducing you know, broader, broader product portfolios, uh, which is making it more complex. Uh, managing the inventory across that's more complex, uh, harder to do, what the right levels are. Uh, the, the, the different models to how to serve the customers, much more um, you know, build to order, configure to order models, uh, you know, postponing that last assembly, those types of things. Uh, and again, often unique per customer, sort of micro market, new delivery options. Again, that's not, uh, I think the sort of all Amazon of same day is, is expected, sort of in the consumer world uh, and in the, in the B2B world, you know, tighter delivery windows, those types of things. And, and being able to accommodate that with new partners uh, and specialty partners to be able to do that. Uh, obviously, I think there's a lot of ter terminology and talk around the digital innovation uh, and logistics have historically been not as digital. So there's huge opportunity and pressure uh, both uh, for, for companies to adopt more digital supply chain using things like Control Tower. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of innovation with new upstarts coming up and providing new business models. And then the third area is around global. And we see that both as uh, an opportunity and threat. So I think from a threat perspective, uh, the customers have more visibility, different product options, uh, more choices. Uh, but from an opportunity perspective, it, uh, the leaders we're seeing are taking advantage and expanding to new markets, and that's requiring them to you know, adopt new partners, uh, you know, both bent and strategic partnerships. So as you're expanding into new markets, that might be, um, if you're on the shipper side, uh, new 3PLs. Uh, and certainly on the on the 3PL side, there may be local parties that you want to work with who understand that market uh, from the transportation stores, those sort of things. So those are the drivers we see uh, really putting pressure on the traditional supply chain. Uh, and some of the barriers are uh, existing systems are 
just too siloed and fragmented. So providing sort of end-to-end ability across the supply chain is extremely challenging to meet the, the customer demands that we're seeing. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, speaking to uh, a prospect, and they had just implemented, they were actually in the middle, they just implemented SAP in the U.S. Uh, they were implementing SAP in Europe and Asia, and that was taking another 18 to 24 months. Uh, but then they looked at this as, well, we just did an acquisition as well. So even though they had just really done a huge effort to sort of homogenize, they did an acquisition and they were already... Uh, more fragmented, and then if you factor in all the partners that you're working with, uh, you know, carriers, suppliers, uh, brokers, forwarders, uh, this is pretty representative, and it makes it pretty challenging to uh, to really provide and serve the customers in the way that they expect today. Uh, so we do we're doing some work with uh, with Gartner, and we're doing a lot of research in this, uh, you know. Well, because supply chain orchestration, control tower, uh, they're calling it uh, multi-enterprise business network. But the concept of connecting parties in the supply chain and the network, they recently did a report on uh, networks connecting to other networks. And they, they feel it's really the foundation for the next generation of platform. Uh, and the way we see our customers adopting that is really in three phases. First is providing, starting with visibility. Uh, and there's there's definitely good pockets of visibility uh, today in the supply chain, but many sort of end to end very detailed granular visibility is also a lot of black holes. So um, one large 3PL worker is just starting with look, we want to provide visibility end to end for our shipments out of Asia into the U.S. Uh, then the next phase after that is to collaborate across the parties, uh, so be able to share information, uh, documents, uh, those types of things. And then finally, being able to optimize that and go to more uh, sort of prescriptive and, and sort of automated flows and sort of hands off, lights out, uh, and really manage the exception. So those are the sort of phases we see our customers adopting. And, and that phased approach is quite important. We'll talk a bit at the end to think about how quick to get payback and not end up with a 18, 24 month project uh, where everyone, you know, the scope changes and it turns into you know a bit more of a science project, so a much more quick, rapid, ton of value, and then use that business and success to to do the next phase. Uh, Dolph, in terms of your uh, experience, in terms of the customer demands, uh, do you have uh, a couple of examples where you know maybe customers have some specific needs that that uh, are, are putting a little pressure on your business and how you accommodate that? Yeah, it's not in terms of specific specific examples. What you see more is uh, being reactive is is not an excuse anymore. Uh, with all the big data being being available, uh, our customers expect us uh, expect proactively uh, uh, proactiveness, not as a nice feature, but having all the data uh, around uh, our customers would at least expect us to be proactive. And uh, I think this is one of the key points in the changes that we've made uh, within within the solutions uh, uh, division in the Netherlands is that that, that that proactiveness and being able to to get all the data that is out there with the carriers that we're using is is giving a even more better approach on on, on the whole. So in terms of pressure, one could say that that uh, uh, proactiveness is, is is not something new. It's something that you should have at least. And this is the kind of pressure that we're seeing currently uh, uh, a lot happening. Yeah, no, a, <clears throat> that proactive is a good point. I, I saw another um, webinar a little while ago where the where the spokesman said, you know, being being proactive is becoming required because finding out after the fact, uh, you know, finding that something happens in an event and you can't do anything about it. It essentially isn't. It turns into a scorecard as opposed to you know, solving the problem before it happens. Uh, so I think that yeah. that proactive and customers are expecting that. You know, they, if you can solve it uh, without them even knowing, um, that's obviously the best case. And if you can solve it uh, and, and give them a notification and um, alter that, to, that help, allows them to run their supply chain uh, and, and avoid issues as well. So that, that's a great point. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about sort of the basics of Control Tower and. And what we see in customers, 
so that's without there's a good definition of Cap Gemini. Um, you know, supply chains control towers, a central hub um, with uh, the required technology, organization, and processes to capture and use supply chain data, providing enhanced visibility for short and long term decision making that's aligned with strategic objectives. So, I think there's a few things that are important here to, to break out. Uh, you know, and certainly from, from an MD object standpoint, uh, providing uh, a robust platform and technology uh, is key. It doesn't necessarily, you know, there's there's people out there who think of a control tower as uh, really an organization uh, and a lot of data entry. Well, certainly that's changing and transforming. Uh, and the other key sort of words here are both short term and long term. Uh, and I'll talk about the sort of different types of control towers that we see customers asking us about that impact that. Um, so typically we 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 just Term, we divide up the control tower sort of in a couple dimensions. One is analytics versus operational. Uh, so operational is your day-to-day, real-time, you know, uh, as um, Dolph suggested, being much more proactive, managed by exception, uh, and really running that operation. Uh, versus an analytics is a little more strategic, looking at uh, the types of uh, partners you have, uh, carriers, uh, suppliers, those types of things and measuring them on a, a longer term basis. Do you have the right network, the right suppliers, those sort of things. Uh, and, and we get requests for both of those. Uh, often people will start with the operational because one of the keys to both of these and really more importantly in the analytics side is getting clean granular data. If it's not in a, uh, if the data isn't normalized and, and uh, presented in the right way, you have analytics that, that people don't end up trusting and can't act on. The other dimension we see is around transportation versus supply chain. Uh, so depending on the technology vendor's uh, heritage, a number of people will, a number of vendors will say, have a control tower. Uh, certainly from our perspective, we see uh, a broader set around supply chain. So it's not just the transportation steps, uh, but it might include uh, steps within the warehouse, that might be assembly picking steps. As I mentioned earlier, you know, at delivery, there may be certification configuration steps, cross stock type steps. Uh, one customer working with is looking to get more visibility into the repair steps uh, on return flow of a uh, spare part and technology. You know, has it been repaired? Does it need to be recycled? Uh, those types of things uh, and give better visibility to, to those non transportation activities. Well, if you, you started out on the uh, sort of operational side, maybe you could sort of comment in sort of how you, uh, how you view the analytics and the value you can provide your business. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. It, what, what we see is um, now that we've implemented the operational part uh, uh, throughout the Netherlands, uh, we're more able to uh, to help our customers with short-term and long-term decision-making uh, uh, processes. Um, we see that their businesses are rapidly changing, and 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 one of those could be uh, the the complete e-commerce uh, uh, that is that is heavily uh, uh, affecting uh, the, the, the complete supply chain. Is that that we we've got a lot of that data in our system, and and. When changes uh, do, uh, are need to be made within that progress, we're uh, we're able to provide our customers with all analytics up front already, and and really can see what the effect is on their business, but already can provide them with alternatives or other solutions, and that could be other carriers uh, uh, um, and and more consolidation processes uh, that that we can provide. So we're able with that data in our hand to. To be a, and this is what I started with, to be more proactive in in decision making uh, processes. So, I think that's the um, that's the biggest uh, value add that we can uh, that we can support uh, support the customers uh, with. Back to you, uh, Brian. Great, excellent, thank you. Uh, so now we're going to dive into uh, some feature function, sort of what we see our customers asking for and implementing to drive their success. Uh, things maybe hopefully you guys can take away uh, and think about in your operation to to improve. Uh, first of all, definition of control tower uh, really provides really optimizing each order uh, based on the end customer's needs on time in full. 
uh, and then a platform extends the various systems I talked about earlier, the fragmented systems in the supply chain. So integrating to uh, both internal and external applications, ERP systems, e, you know, warehouse systems for, to look at inventory options, uh, transportation systems to, to look at time and transit and costs, uh, and then collaborating and providing uh, visibility and ability to act across all the various parties in the supply chain. Um, so sort of from a, from a footprint standpoint, that's how we, we see the, the, the control tower. In terms of the, the critical functions, we've identified 15 uh, critical functions really grouped into five areas. Uh, so first of all, and we'll drill into each of these uh, in the next few minutes, uh, multi-order, multi-level order management, uh, multi-tier inventory management, multi-mode transport management. So those that are providing that optimized uh, order, and it could be a purchase order from an inbound standpoint, uh, could be international order, uh, could be an e-commerce order. We'll get into some of the different flows uh, a little later, but that's really managing that order end to end. And then sitting on top of it is providing that analytics and reporting control tower. And then critical to it is a network of partners. Uh, so being able to collaborate across those. And, and as we saw earlier, I mentioned earlier, we see customers as they're expanding, getting to new markets, uh, really building up more specialty type partners uh, and uh, expanding that and being able to leverage that as a differentiated supply chain to serve uh, their end customers in a more effective way. So let's look at uh, the three characteristics for multi-order, multi-level order management. Uh, and it's really comes down to really find end-to-end -end, uh, across all parties, uh, being able to collaborate, uh, and then a lot of configurability. Uh, so I'll give you an example here. Uh, so by end-to-end, uh, -end we're talking, you know, in this case, getting visibility to here, we have a specific flow, it's, a, it's an international, uh, air shipment, uh, being able to say, okay, at the supplier, there's some uh, labels that need to get printed. Uh, there's documents that need to get get uh, prepared and ready for the transport. Those might be a straight bill of lading. It might be commercial invoice, those types of things. Uh, it's, it's ready to be loaded. So providing a very detailed granular letter visibility that the various parties can see. Um, and then the other pieces to think about how configurable, in this case, it's, uh, it's an airflow, uh, that, but typically our customers end up with many of these. And, and our, our basic philosophy is each order should have a micro supply chain, which is represented here to serve it and optimize and best serve that customer. Uh, and it's determined through sort of, you know, optimizing based on cost, obviously you know, meeting the service requirements that are required for that customer. Uh, but also looking at things like capacity. Uh, so, uh, and then be able to configure and service uh, this across all the different sort of micro markets that a customer is serving uh, and provide that end-to-end -end visibility across all the various parties. Uh, Dolph, I don't know if there's a couple of uh, scenarios or different, different flows uh, that you can talk about uh, at DSV, leveraging sort of the flexibility uh, and serving your customers in a more tailored way. Yeah, there there are different uh, uh, different flows that, that 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 we're handling, and I think they're uh, uh, they are pretty known to 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 a lot of people. And that's like uh, multi lag uh, zone skipping, uh, consolidation models uh, like consolidation at origin, but as well as uh, from 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 our warehouse perspective, and that only uh, that that that's that applies to. Uh, 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 the business of pallets, parcels, uh, B2B and B2C. So we're, we're getting, uh, 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 at this moment, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of zone skipping uh, models uh, where we're going directly into the country and uh, using a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of parties that are very familiar in every specific country. Um, but also getting into more consolidation of both uh, parcels and pallets and getting it to one flow uh, to our customers um, instead of having all spread uh, volumes uh, uh, being sent to our customers. So we see that um, that these are kind of models that are 
uh, that are pretty known in, in, in the branch, but uh, uh, we're able to use them more because of uh, having all the data already up front uh, uh, visible and really looking at, at, at setting up new structures for uh, the majority uh, of our customers, but also specific on demands uh, of, of, of customers. Yeah, and, and we see also the ability so to sort of help, you know, maybe there's new customers who are working with a, a, a large global 3PL providing, they're trying to win some new customers and the flexibility of sort of the flows and new requirements that the customer needs allows them to win and expand new customers. So, uh, and, and again, Golf, as you said, expanding into maybe some new geographies, new countries, uh, connecting into some specialty partners there as, as part of this flow uh, and giving them sort of the visibility and, and uh, integration as well. Okay. So uh, the next is around multi-tiered inventory. So visibility to network inventory, dynamic sourcing based on where that inventory is and available, uh, and mixed up models of, of ownership. Uh, so there's a few scenarios which I'll talk about here. So think about when we talk about multi-tiered network inventory, well, we're seeing customers look a little more broadly outside, this, certainly even within an enterprise, within a company, looking at things like central distribution and and forward stocking locations, local warehouses, getting better visibility across that. But it becomes a little more complicated if they're using, uh, one example we're using with a spare parts uh, fulfillment, the, the, the central DC and the forward stocking locations are managed by a separate, two separate 3PL. So getting that visibility uh, to that inventory is important. Um, but another scenario is leveraging, let's say suppliers. Uh, so that supplier may do drop ship uh, directly to the customer and, you know, standard flow might be leveraging a distribution center, but based on well, not just what inventory is available, but maybe that supplier has inventory, maybe that supplier is closer to the customer, so they can be a proxy sort of warehouse uh, on your behalf and ship directly. So it lowers cost of uh, carrying inventory, lowers transportation costs. Uh, there's another uh, customer we work with where they have a dealer network. Uh, and they provide consigned inventory to those dealers, uh, and they're, you know, they're looking at a model where even one dealer could be shipping on behalf of another, which they haven't been able to do before. Uh, so providing that, um, first of all, the visibility of the network, uh, where that inventory is, either internal or external, with party with other partners. Some of that might be actually in transit, uh, could be, you know, an inbound shipment uh, that's coming in via ocean, and, and you want to split that off. Uh, instead of taking it to a DC, maybe send it directly to a retailer, those types of things. Uh, and then being able to use real-time uh, allocation and information to more effectively fulfill that order uh, from, a, from a cost standpoint. Uh, so, so those are some of the so those are more advanced things we're seeing in multi-tier inventory. Uh, and then to sort of finish out the, uh, the, the order model, transportation, multi-level, uh, order model, continuous optimization, uh, and I did I talked about earlier, capturing both transportation and non-transportation steps. Uh, so let's look at that. So here's typical sort of flow, which is you know, some consolidation at the front end. Uh, so when we talk about multi-level order consolidation, being able to mix and match uh, different orders coming in, it could be some consolidation for a line haul, that might be a truck, it might be a train, uh, you know, a boat or a plane, uh, being able to track the, the steps in the crosstalk. Uh, and and in, in, in sort of key requirements uh, of a control tower, you want to be able to uh, really have an any-to-any -any model. So any number of uh, legs can be uh, imported and, and line hauled, or it could get split into a couple different shipments. So, for example, let's say it's a, a shipment from Asia, uh, often that's in something like apparel, you know, a few thousand units are being ordered uh, and based on production that may come across in two shipments uh, and, and that's going to meet the, the merchandising plan and the, and the plan on the stores. Uh, whereas perhaps in another model where you're doing more uh, right now working with a, a repairs uh, flow where repairs go to the OEMs in Asia uh, and they may be coming from multiple customers in the U.S., uh, but the shipment back into the U.S. gets consolidated 
and then deconsolidated out uh, for delivery out back to the central DC. Uh, so really thinking about it in terms of, uh, you know, any order can get consolidated any shipment or can get split into multiple shipments into multiple legs. That flexibility uh, becomes important. Uh, and to really to handle all the use cases and scenarios that, uh, that are going to support the business and the expansion. The other area is continuous optimization. So looking at, in that network, looking at things like capacity, looking at where inventory is, looking at costs, activity costs, transportation costs, and optimizing that each and every order gets that micro supply chain executed flawlessly uh, to meet the uh, customer's demands in terms of on time and in full. And then, as I talked about earlier, being able to track uh, non-transportation steps. Uh, so there's a you know, customer where we're working where they do uh, some um, footwear, and they do both e-commerce and uh, wholesale shipments. Uh, and they have a cross dock. They need to do some palletization. They want to give their customer visibility to where those steps are in the cross dock. Uh, in terms of assembly, they hold some inventory uh, for last minute delivery to some stores. Uh, so they also need to provide some visibility and steps uh, around uh, that information to their customer. Uh, Dolph, I don't know if there's some, some sort of more complex transport flows uh, that, you, that you've implemented in the last sort of 12 to 18 months that, that would be worth sharing. Yeah, uh, Brian. So what what you see is that what uh, what I just already mentioned is that uh, uh, we're handling now from uh, from a solutions freight department. We're handling uh, inbound and out outbound volumes of our of our customers. We're able to to also uh, handle uh, or it's via road or in air and sea uh, handle that that complete uh, flow. So. With that in mind, we're we're seeing like uh, uh, models like zone skipping, multi-leg, uh, and and consolidation uh, processes getting more and more interesting in in terms of the complete volume, uh, but also in terms of uh, uh, of of the the sole volume of uh, of our of a single customer. So with that in mind, we're able to to really get into cost saving uh, uh, opportunities um, and uh, especially what I said said already said with uh, zone skipping possibilities to get a more overview on on the data itself we're already uh, prepared on on those kind of models and to get them implemented even further so it are uh, it are it's it's merely in, in terms of the yeah milk runs zone skipping models and etc that uh, that have been implemented that have already shown a huge uh, benefit for for our customers in that perspective so back to you brian excellent thank you thank you um so now let's uh, sort of go off of operational look at uh the sort of analytics and reporting uh so sort of key things are supply chain performance partner scorecards uh you know, freight spend margin analysis uh, <clears throat> And this provides that spectrum I talked about earlier, going from sort of day-to-day -day operational uh, metrics, making sure that things are flowing as they should, uh, and, and trying to move to sort of your hands off, lights out, uh, and more managed by exception. So looking at that from capabilities around things like you know setting up milestones, which milestones weren't hit, even being able to accept unexpected or, or get visibility to things or unexpected events uh, that might be. Um, you know, a truck breakdown, weather, those types of things that, that uh, are in the, in the master plan and being able to get visibility to those. Uh, even basic things like uh, being able to share documents. Uh, you know, the, the not having the right documents in uh, you know, the international shipment can get that held up and cause delays for the customer. So ensuring that those are being, uh, being able to, you know, even setting up, hey, here's required documents that need to be uh, included before you go to the next step. Uh, that can create that can really smooth things out and cause a, uh, a much smoother and, and avoid issues where uh, those might get get missed. Um, or similarly, another customer working with is uh, in providing uh, transportation and, and warehousing services. And for them, the, the proof of uh, delivery uh, is a critical point because that allows them to invoice back their customer. Uh, so.
so those are some of the operational uh, sort of visibility and metrics that, that we see. Uh, <clears throat> the next level is uh, scorecard. So looking at, again, sort of basic things in terms of on-time delivery, uh, you know, uh, and then more broadly, overall service level agreements, uh, how quickly do suppliers respond to a purchase order, how you know carriers responding to a tender, uh, so some of those things beyond this actual performance, uh, and then being able to measure, hey, where's the margin across customers by geography in the freight area? Uh, so being able to really fine tune the business and, and and serve customers and and figure out which which are the most profitable and serve them and provide them in that 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 uh, you know the right level of expansion uh, and growth. Um, and then finally looking at uh, you know, do you have the right network, the right strategy in terms of supply chain? Uh, what's the mix of carriers? Should it be larger? Should we, do we need to add more specialty for, church, for, for a particular uh, market or set of, set of products or, or services or its region? Um, how, do we, how do we support that the, the business's growth uh, in terms of uh, growing our network? You know, more broadly, cost to serve. Uh, so in terms of margin, but there's internal activity costs, those sort of things, uh, you know, even granular at each order, uh, being able to determine the cost to serve and, and, and fine tuning that in terms of driving the overall performance of the company. And then the last is in terms of internal performance, uh, the, you know, the planning team and improving those types of, you know, those should that be centralized and some of the things that, uh, that Dolph talks about is, you know, moving from, let's say regional or, or more siloed work to centralized can also provide some benefits. So that's in terms of uh, looking more strategically and some of the information you get from the analytics perspective. Um, and then we'll lastly, we'll talk about uh, the network. Uh, and this is again, really pretty, pretty uh, thriving and sort of hot area. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Gartner's doing a lot of work on it. Uh, but being able to, in looking at a provider <clears throat> and then your own network, can they support different types, uh, you know, not just transportation, but there's international things like forwarding, brokerage, uh, repair depots, repair centers, uh, OEMs, manufacturing, and being able to handle those different types of flows and steps and the visibility, uh, and then be able to connect them in. Uh, so think about so your core set of partners of an integrated network, uh, now, as you're looking to expand, maybe for a particular customer, a particular geography, uh, that's going to continue to, you know, put pressure on working with uh, some of those specialty partners, uh, and that you know, getting them connected in and being able to treat them as if they're a resource within your enterprise, within your company, uh, to be just as effective and agile and, and help serve their customers and your customers jointly uh, becomes important. So from a technology platform standpoint, thinking about flexible ways they can get integrated uh, uh, in different modes. And, and some of those customers, some of those partners are very advanced, so they may have very modern ways to connect web services. Some are very primitive. They can they don't even have the technology. Maybe they're sending simple flat files or, or uh, and being able to handle those different modes and get them onboarded and sharing information based on their capabilities and based on the, the investment and the return on that investment. Uh, so is that integration gonna, you know, that volume of business justified or, or maybe it's best to use uh, a portal, but it also depends on the business relationship and how large they are. So flexibility and options on how to onboard uh, partners as well in different types. Uh, so with that, uh, Dolph, I'm gonna pass it to you to uh, give, uh, Give the group uh, some insight into what you've done and then the success you've had. Yes, thank you, uh, Brian. So, um, if you could flick to the next slide, please. So, um, obviously, I'm talking from Solutions Netherlands perspective. Um, I already mentioned uh, there are several locations in the Netherlands. There are five strategic locations in the Netherlands, and uh, currently we are handling over more than 1.3 million uh, shipments per year. And that's uh, 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 that could be parcel shipments, pallet shipments, uh, uh, B2B and B2C. Um, 
um, what you what our responsibility is that for from from the moment a, a a shipment leaves from one of our warehouses, uh, uh, w uh, the freight management team is getting responsible for for the outbound shipments, and that's what we're uh, responsible for for more than uh, 25 strategic car carriers in relationship. And that's uh, pallets carriers uh, or uh, integrated uh, uh, carriers, uh, and responsible for more than uh, 150 customers where we're executing uh, the shipments for. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so here you've got an overview of the sites that, we've, that we have uh, in, in the Netherlands. And, and uh, Netherlands is not that big. It's two by four hours, I would, uh, I would normally say. Um, but what, what, we, what we've seen in the past is that the transport activities were locally managed. So on every site that uh, that we have, the, the, the execution and the complete management would take place uh, there. So that, that has led to a lot of carriers that we used uh, within the site. So a lot of local, uh, uh, but also European carriers that, uh, that we've used. Um, so not a lot of performance metrics uh, that uh, that were in place, and and that also meant that freight spend and margins and etc. Uh, were really uh, uh, very locally uh, uh, if they would uh, would be uh, available. So one could imagine um, that uh, uh, with at at that particular moment, uh, uh, do we have complete visibility on on all the uh, uh, all the invoices that we're receiving from from carriers? Uh, and are we also 100% that everything is a is a good match, and and that also led to a a lot of clerical work that we wanted to fade out. So with that in mind, and that's also within the next slide, uh, Brian. With that in mind, we've um, we've spoken, and, and Brian already uh, talked talked very extensively about this. Is the a control tower setup and. And yet again, if if you're talking to 100 different people uh, about what is specific a control tower, you would get 100 different answers. I uh, I would assume. Yeah, in terms of um, so the technology uh, and working, we've really worked with DSV for a number of years, uh, and I think certainly the, the execution, being able to some of the criteria that they were looking at is uh, someone who's successful in logistics, uh, being able to provide that flexible. You know, they've talked about some of the zone skipping, uh, milk runs, consolidating parcel, and mix of e-commerce and pallet and, and small package. So being able to provide those flexible options uh, to serve their customers. Uh, and, and in the fragmented, um, sort of where they were run locally, they really didn't have any visibility. So being able to provide uh, the, the sort of central view across all of their locations, across all of their carriers was a key. Uh, and then obviously being able to really tightly integrate. And one of the keys, you know, providing this and sort of providing the flexibility is uh, the cloud architecture, uh, being able to connect into their systems, uh, connect to the carriers and provide that detailed visibility on the carrier front. Um, and then uh, in the, um, the other piece, not just being able to serve and, and sort of execute with those carriers. Uh, and Dolph had talked a bit about sort of the cost savings in freight uh, and um, consolidate less, less carriers, but also on the audit side, being able to ensure that uh, the, the invoices coming in and the, and the freight costs uh, according to the contracts were aligned. So they weren't mispaying, they weren't, uh, they was accurate to what their, what their agreements were in place. Perfect. Um, wh why don't I jump into some questions now? One of the interesting questions or one of the sort of areas I had raised uh, in the Q&A from the audience was um, looking at in incorporating other pieces of data into into the control tower, things uh, that I guess haven't fully been mentioned just yet, but things like social media and news and things like that. Is, is that something, you know, is that something that you're finding your customers are requesting uh, at all within uh, your solutions or uh, is that something you, that's on your radar at all? Yeah, no, that's a, that's exactly the type of uh, thing you know that in, in those uh, configurable uh, sort of flows, being able to capture that type of information. And some of that's a bit downstream if it's going to be de de determining sort of the demand plan, uh, but certainly things like uh, you know weather, 
uh, things that are impacting the operational uh, sort of flow of goods uh, are, are getting things factored in for sure. Um, to what degree are logistics providers, uh, you know, using this sort of increased level of visibility? Are they providing that data and information to their customers? Uh, you know, I'm just thinking in terms of you know things like e-commerce and things like that. You know, the retailers, et cetera, are demanding more and more data from from their entire sort of network. Uh, how is that relationship working uh, from your perspective? Yeah, and there's there's a couple of answers. So certainly on the on what we call the shipper side, so those you know. The, uh, managing and driving the, the inventory, uh, their their customers, both in B2C and B2B, are asking for more and more information. Uh, so, for example, uh, it's not just good enough to say uh, that the order even has shipped and here's the ASM, here's the tracking, uh, but even upstream, especially with the more build-to-order models. Uh, so one customer, for example, they have about a six-week lead time because it's all built to order, configured to order. Uh, and they have very good performance delivering once that product's built. Uh, but their customers are asking for better visibility to, hey, where are you in that build cycle? Has it been scheduled? Has the equipment been tested? They're, they're, they do uh, heavy equipment. Uh, so they their customers want visibility from, hey, I sent your purchase order. I understand it's four to six weeks until... Uh, the order gets uh, shipped, and the shipping time is fairly quick, so there's a very high on time and full rate, but they're like, there's a big gap there, four to six weeks, which you don't have visibility. So they want to provide more visibility to to those steps, uh, again, to sort the of non-manufacturing steps. Uh, another scenario might be around in the warehouse, uh, value-added, maybe kitting steps, assembly steps, those types of things, so we're seeing customers demand more visibility earlier in the order cycle. Uh, and then on the 3PL side, LSP side, which is a service provider, uh, similar things, and you know, some of the same uh, sort of detailed visibility. Uh, one customer we work with what does heavy equipment and automotive, and they do uh, a lot of interim storage of that inventory uh, at uh, you know, port terminals, and they keep it there for seven to 10 days uh, and then deliver it. Uh, you know, with some consolidation and some uh, assembly steps as well. And their customers also are looking for visibility. Hey, what's the inventory you have? Where is it? Uh, if you have some of those assembly steps, what are those? So uh, those are some of the things we're seeing from our customers. Got it. Um, one of the uh, things that we were going to be covering, uh, moving a bit forward down down the slide deck, was looking at the future. Uh, that was Dolph was going to speak to that, and specifically, uh, you know, partnering with you guys on some advanced analytics. I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit, um, just just given that Dolph is unable to log in at the moment. <laughs> yeah. So um, that again, looking, you think back to. Uh, the operational I talked about as an example, network inventory. So you may have inventory in your central DC, local DC. There may be a set of 3PLs where you have some inventory suppliers uh, and executing and operating on that, but then taking a step back and saying, okay, uh, looking analytically is where that is, where that inventory is, uh, and, you know, should that get reallocated, those types of things. So there's an example of sort of, of you know, a broader analytical view uh, on the inventory front. Uh, you know, another example would be uh, looking at and, and some of the some of the um, some of the success that that Dolph had in in reducing uh, the number of carriers. So, do you have overlapping carriers in particular lanes serving customers? Is your ability to consolidate, uh, or maybe there's a carrier that you want to add? They have specialty capabilities. Uh, you know, for maybe maybe you're serving customers in a, in a metropolitan congested area, uh, and they have uh, you know skills to you know, you know they're, they're set up to serve those customers better, and you're seeing growth in that segment. Uh, so, looking sort of strategically on your mix of partners uh, and how they serve your customers uh, is an element. Um, and if we um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sorry go ahead. That was, I was going to say, you know, I can maybe step through a couple of uh, examples of sort of time to value, which uh, we've seen, which is sort of 
helps customers, help people think about, hey, how do I implement this? What's the time frames I should think about? What are the steps I should take? Uh, and then if Tom can get back in, we can wrap up with his, uh, his success. And I can, if not, I can also go through it as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, and, and just to let the audience know that I'll, I'll be handing out Dolph's email address to everyone. So if you do have questions and if you do want to know a little bit more about what he was talking about and if he's unable to log in, then we can communicate with him that way. Um, but yeah, Brian, uh, over to you. So great. Uh, so one of the things with the broad set of, you know, we talked about flexible order flows and we see our customers starting typically with one or two flows. It could be you know, here we're showing some outbound flows, could be straight e-commerce uh, fulfillment, it might be domestic, it might be international, uh, maybe more complex. So um, right now we're with a customer that has, uh, you know, different manufacturing locations and they get orders that needs to be fulfilled through four or five different locations. So they're able to sort of manage those and in some cases those might get direct shipped, they might get consolidated at a pool point. Uh, so being able to manage that for just a little manage standpoint. Uh, another area is in aftermarket. I've talked to a number of customer examples there, spare parts in reverse. Uh, and then on the left here we have uh, some inbound that might be international import, uh, might be straight vendor, uh, direct ship, those types of things, VMI models. But the key is to pick sort of a key flow, start, get going, get some success and expand on it. Uh, and then we see our customers continuing to build out the flows and expand the success uh, of that. Uh, some examples we've seen um, is uh, in they really span from sort of a six seven week success to you know depending on scope uh, up to twelve months. But we really recommend trying to do think about it and hey what can you get done in three months and then leverage that success to do another phase and really have sort of a much more agile phased approach uh, to, to build that success. Um, so this is an example here where you have the different industries, different types of, of um, uh, uh, timelines and, and just thinking about trying not to get everything in, really thinking about hey, what are the most critical elements, what are the biggest pain points, uh, so one customer started out with just providing visibility they have uh, to their spare parts central and, and forged off the location. And then once they have that visibility, now they're leveraging some more orchestration on, hey, how do they improve the transportation flows up to the service technicians? And then they have that complete. Then the next phase is handling the reverse and then the repair back to the OEMs. So in that case, it's sort of a four phase approach. Uh, and then that also allows minimized risk in terms of the scope smaller, the timeline shorter, uh, and learning, learning you know the business processes and improving that the technology, work with the different partners as well. Uh, so there's a continuous learning aspect to that as well. So uh, so that's sort of the thinking about it in terms of hey, what steps to take? Uh, I'd say look at. Start with you know, what are the business priorities in terms of what you're trying to uh, to uh, achieve. That might be winning new customers. It might be improving service and customers. Uh, it might be improving operational efficiency. It might be you know driving spend. It might be a number of those things. It's usually not just one for sure, uh, but picking, picking, lining with those objectives, identifying some of the key flows that uh, that are uh, can be improved there. And then mapping that into uh, sort of the partner's technology and then picking exactly. I think the scope is really important to try to say, hey, hit the most critical, not everything, and get value quickly and build on that success. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Brian. Um, let, let's go to at least one question from the audience uh, just before we hit the top of the hour uh, and, and shut things down here. Um, yeah, lots of questions have come in. Um, and so there's a lot of different ones. And so I'm going to actually ask a question that's more uh, <laughs> trend-based based on the, the number of uh, questions that have come in. And risk has come up a lot and managing risk. And I wondered if you could speak to um, control towers and helping manage risk uh, a little bit further. Yeah, absolutely. So certainly having sort of the 
predefined plan and how things should work and, and being able to measure that against milestones uh, for each. And, and again, they're going to be different by customer, by segment, uh, but having that sort of set up in uh, and then getting visibility where those aren't happening and being able to get those events. And risk could come in you know, multiple dimensions, right? It could be uh, sort of operational things like, you know, weather, uh, breakdown of, of equipment, those types of things. So being able to, as Dolph mentioned earlier, getting visibility to that earlier and with enough time to actually act and solve the problem. So it does, you know, getting visibility, if you can't actually go back and re-optimize and deliver it on time, is not, not, a, not enough nowadays. It's really about being proactive. So getting that event uh, and then being able to re-optimize uh, across your that flow and leverage uh, some new paths and delivering that order and those goods on time. So that's sort of operational risk uh, is one element of it. You know, on the sort of analytics or strategic risk in terms of you know, visibility to the right partners uh, and, uh, and 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 are they the right sort of set to, to provide uh, long term sort of partnership and strategic and, and does that suddenly continue investing and grow that relationship or is it something that's going to be uh, should be sort of mitigated and, and think about different partners. Uh, and again, that, you know, that some of that can come from the analytics data, uh, but things like, you know, sort of labor or, or political situations or sort of, so that's typically inside the scope of certainly what we end up with, uh, but sort of performance and, and some of those things are over that over a period of, of that can factor into that risk. Great. Um, I think actually we have Dolph back. Dolph, is, are you, are you with us again? Yes, I do apologize for that. Yes. N not to worry. Uh, it wouldn't be a, a modern webinar without some technical hiccups here and there. Um, uh, so, Dolph, uh, Brian quickly ran through some of your slides there. So we were just addressing some of the questions. Um, and so uh, I guess one of the ones that sort of jumped out at me was maybe looking at the future from DSV's perspective um, in terms of you know, innovation and things like that. I wondered if you could sort of run, run maybe through your, your, your side of that uh, before we close. Yeah, so what you see on, on especially the what was able to to achieve is, is, is the most importantly is to get a centralized overview on on transportation as a whole, and besides savings on 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 freight spend, um, uh, what you see is a far much more accuracy on on performance of our carriers itself that we're far much able to really reflect on not solely the performance sheets that we are uh, uh, receiving from our carriers, but also really are uh, more capable of getting into the, the details on, on, on the exact uh, volumes that have been sent out and the exact performance on that. So I think that that's one of the, the, the key points. And if you can see that on the next slide as well, uh, Heli, is that um, if you look to the the, 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 the aspects that we're going into uh, even more in depth are are more inbound, so more and more 4PL uh, solutions in, in aspect of that, and also the direct ship programs uh, uh, combined with our with our customers. So more able to really go into the the local solutions and and set up and, and setting up structures that support that business, and I think. One of the key points is that together with MPO, we're going more and more into getting more metrics and KPIs uh, uh, supporting our business uh, from a Solutions Netherlands perspective, but as well the business of our customers and to be more able on getting that data uh, uh, presentable to our customers. And I think the next steps we would see in the uh, end of Q1 uh, that we're able to to be even more close on, on the data and, and really going into meta analytics. And I think that's the most important part for us, uh, but also for the, 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 the freight team that handles the day-to-day -day shipments, that they have more tools in, 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 in handling and be more proactive to, to the customers in itself. And I think that there are the most, there are the most important parts uh, that, we're, that we're going uh, uh, to look into also in, in the near future. Heli. Perfect. Thanks so much, Dolph, for that. Um, obviously, we've gone past the, the, the top of the hour. We're in extra time, uh, as they might say, in a, a football match. So um, what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to call it there. 
but I'm going to be sending out recordings tomorrow. Um, and all of those questions that we weren't able to get to, um, uh, it's going to be with Brian and Dolph, so they'll be able to respond to you directly. But I'm also going to give all of you, the audience, uh, both Dolph and Brian's email addresses so we can continue the conversation that way. Um, I wanted to thank both Brian and Dolph for being with me today. Um, and I also wanted to thank you, the audience, of course, for tuning in as well. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Cheers. Bye.